Okay, welcome everyone to another evening of uh, the Dynalearn at Killamarine Park. Uh, again, we're learning Hilchus Nadar, and we're learning from the Kitzur Shulchan I don't know what happened to our photocopies, uh, but you don't really need it. <clears throat> Tonight, I think we're just going to discuss a few interesting um, questions of Hilchus interesting Nadarim that came up, and interesting solutions to various questions. Uh, most of this I'm taking from Rav Shlomo Avinir's commentary on Kitzur Shulchan Aruch, but it's him quoting other people uh, anyway. Uh, so the first question we'll we'll discuss um, is of uh, uh, this is this is actually very fascinating. So someone in let's say Russia, um, his son was was uh, drafted into the army, and he took a letter that if his son comes back from from the army whole, he comes back sh- shalom, b'shalom. If he comes back b'shalom, so then um, he'll give a lot of money to tzedakah, let's say a million dollars to tzedakah. So after however long it is, two years, let's say, he comes back, and the uh, son is healthy, and he comes back with a non-Jewish wife. So the c- question is, is that considered b'shalom, or is, or is it not? And there's a million dollars on the line, so you want to get a good answer. So the, uh, they brought it to the Emek Halacha. The Emek Halacha, first he wants to say like this, Yaakov Avinu, when he, it's, it could be, it's a Beferish Rashi. Right, Yaakov Avinu, when he's go, about to go out to, to, to Lavan, he's running away from his parents' home, he's going to Lavan. Vayidor Yaakov neder. Lamar Yaakov takes a neder. And he says, If Hashem is with me, And he protects me. And he gives me food to eat and clothing to wear. And I return to my father's house. Hashem li leilokim. Rashi says, what does it mean, Bishalom? He already talked about protecting him physically and feeding him and clothing him. So what does it mean, Bishalom? Rashi says, Bishalom, Shalem min hachet. Shalom almad mi darche lavon. That he won't learn from the evil ways of lavon. So we see Bishalom even means spiritually. So maybe you could say that this nether, that his son should come back, Bishalom, includes that he should be come back without any uh, obvious, big, blatant of errors. So if he said he comes back alive, would certainly have to keep his net. Certainly. Okay. Certainly, if he said a lie. Does it mean psychologically, though? Would it mean, like, if he was, uh, the individual was psychologically scarred? Um, so if he was emotionally... Uh, well, well, so if someone, let's say someone comes back injured, believe that happens. Uh, more often than someone not coming back, they come back injured. So I don't know what the answer would be. <laughs> so, um, Bahaba, they, they say maybe not, maybe not so much, because there um, Yaakov was specifically saying Bishalom in a spiritual sense, uh, because he had already discussed all the physical senses. Here, this man did not specify whether he meant spiritual or physical, so maybe it's not a proof. So, the Emek Alecha brings a very, very interesting proof from, um, from a Mishnah in Masechus Tivol Yom. So you have a pit, a bore, a pit full of wine, right? Think of it in terms of a well, uh, but, you know, it's covered on the bottom because they, they just had to stick all the wine someplace. They didn't have, um, you know, they had barrels and they didn't have big barrels. So instead they had a pit. And how, you, how, you fish out or you, you pull out wine from the barrel, from the, pit, from the pit with one barrel. You put it on a string, you lift it up. Um, so all, that, all the wine down there um, is, is still tevel. No truma or mice was taken from it. And as you're lifting up the barrel with the wine, so you declare it to be truma. So while you're lifting it up, what happens if the barrel breaks or some of the wine spills? Truma falls back into the wine and it's all meduma, and you've got a problem. So if you say, if you take truma, so the, so the way to do it is you take truma with a condition. So the Mishnah says, Tavul Yom, Perik Dalet, Mishnah Zayin, Hatarim es Abor, Ve'omar, Harezo truma amanas shetale shalom, you, have a, you say, your condition is, the wine in this barrel that I'm taking out of the pit is, will be truma on condition that it comes up, shalom. <coughs> so it's a machlok, it's the Tanakama and Rabbi Shimon. The Tanakama says, shalom mina shever, mina shvicha, as long as the barrel doesn't break and then the wine spills, avalom mina toma. But if it's tame, it's still truma. So you lifted up the wine and somehow it becomes t- tame, someone touched it improperly, however it was, on the way up, it became tame. So that doesn't invalidate the condition because you said shalom and shalom means as long as it doesn't break or spill 
And therefore, even if it's tame, it's still truma. Rabbi Shimon Omer, Afmina Tumma, Rabbi Shimon says, no, even if it comes up and it's tame, then the condition um, goes into effect and it's not considered truma. So, so hold on, so, so then applying that to our condition, we pass in like the Tanakama, that Shalom does not apply to Tuma, so therefore it suggests the Amek Halacha. So he came back uh, and he was married to a non Jewish woman, so that is some sort of a, you know, spiritually Tame, and therefore that does not invalidate the condition, and he's still obligated to give the million dollars. That's not his final reasoning, but that's, I thought, the cleverest uh, answer that he had. Do you have a question? Yeah, um, so he said yes, you have to give the million dollars. I'll, in, a minute, in a second, I'll, I'll, in a moment, I'll explain Final to you point. why. In yeah. the sense of this being true or not, is that um, in regard to um, like him being glad to take Truma again, or is in regard to like a Kohen being able to keep the Truma? No, it's, it's the other way around. Once that's Truma, then he can, all the other wine is good. You don't have to take Truma again on it. But the co- it's still considered Tame Truma for a Kohen. Right, right correct. Okay. Correct. But if, if it had spilled over or broken, then he'd have to take Truma again from all, all, the, all the wine. Now, his, his final conclusion is, look, the, guy, the, the woman can decide she wants to become Jewish and convert you know, with full, full intent, and everything would be good, or they, they could get divorced. So since it's not um, irrevocable, irrevocable um, it could always be fixed. So therefore, you should give the money. And uh, that should be the chutz, that uh, things should work out for the best. That, that was one, I thought, a very interesting and clever, uh, clever Shiloh that came up and a clever, clever answer. So, uh, uh, so here's an interesting question. So that, that's um, a neder beis sarah, right? It's good when you're in a difficult situation to take a neder. He took a neder beis sarah, and then uh, he had a complicated answer. So we just talked about that again. Guy comes home with the shikh, with the effectively. There are such words we don't use. Okay, I'm sorry. With somebody out of the faith. Okay. An interfaith marriage. So he allowed this. He said that they, he has to pay a million dollars because his. I, I need. I, I, I need clarity on this. I don't want no, to nobody's saying that marriage is okay. Nobody's. The, the question is, does a father have to keep his neder? Right. That's that's what I'm driving at. So and what was the terrorist The conclusion thing? was yes. Because because the the son came home alive, and well, and. It, fine, fine. Uh, there's a spiritual problem, but that might be fixed anyway. So, as viewed as the gum, then I guess. The, oh, the even if it is, even if it is some sort of a spiritual uh, uh, gum, it it can be remedied, and it's not clear that a spiritual gum is is a problem anyway for this but matter. If, and if he came back, let's say, uh, I'm, I'm just going to extend that thought. Then, uh, you know, let's say he came back and he was mature, so he totally gave up uh, Yiddish. He was no longer from. Yeah. I, that seems to be the case here. I mean, it's, it's rare for someone to come back with a non Jewish wife and still be Shomashabbos. Right. Even in this example, it doesn't make a difference. That's what it seems to be. So the, uh, the Nasiv had a nephew um, who wrote the, the Torah to Mima. His name was Baruch, uh, Baruch Halevi Epstein. Um, he eventually became a banker, and in his spare time, he, his uncle said, Send me your chidushim. So he wanted to make sure his, his nephew was learning. And that's how the, he wrote the Torah to Mima. So interestingly, in the introduction of the Torah to Mima, he says, I wrote this for mostly at the office or on the, on the move, which is pretty impressive. And I didn't always write where I heard a source from. I didn't always remember where I heard an idea from. Um, so I'm not, I, I can't write all my sources. But you should know, here are a few farms where I took uh, a lot of my material from. And uh, one of them is called the Ravid Azov. Ravid Azov lived in the times of the Vilna Gon. He was... Uh, he, he was a victim of a terrible tragedy. He was learning in his house. The house collapsed all around him. It's like a window was open, and the window fell right around him while he was learning, but everything else was destroyed. And um, so after that, he decided he would write a sefer, um, and his sefer was one of the first to connect Torah Shabbat Shabbat with Torah Shabbat Peh, uh, which is a pretty popular style that happened ever since him. So a lot of the Torah to Mimo's material comes from the Ravid Azov, and he writes in the introduction. When did it start to uh, uh, write his sefer? Torah to me was the late 1800s. Meaning, he, on a Pasuk, he says, the halachas are, and, some, and we can see it in this Pasuk this way. Um, so, uh, he, some of it he takes directly from the Gemara. Some of it he takes the Rashba, Paskins this way, and you can see it in the Pasuk here. 
Yeah, but that's that's why he's making the connection. He's taking from the beginning to the end and connecting them. Yeah, and very clever. A lot of it's very clever. Uh, so the Tartumima writes when he was, I, I assume when he was younger, um, he was in his uncle's house, Motzei Shabbos. A lot of rabbin in there. Someone came in with a shail. Halacha l'maisa. He got into a big fight with someone, and he took a nether shvu. He took a vow never to see the, look this guy in the face again. And what happened? The guy died. And he wants to go, and he wants to look him in the face and, and ask for mechila. Is he allowed to go and ask him for mechila? This is Motzei Shabbos Parshat B'Shalach. Or because of his shvua, is he not allowed to? So the Rabbanim are, are, are saying, well, did he have this in mind? Did he have in mind a lie? Did he not have in mind the dead? And the Torah Tamima says, what do you mean? We just laid it this way, in this parasha. Because the it says, right, at, at the beginning of, uh, in Perak Yudal, it says, Ki asher isim es Mitzrayim hayom, you see Mitzrayim today, lo sosifu lirosam od ad olam. You'll never see Mitzrayim again. You'll never see the Mitzrayim again. Later, in that very same parak, it says, Vayar Yisrael es Mitzrayim mis al svas hayom. They did see them. And they were dead. So, then they're dead. So, so, so he says, so what's the terrorist? The terrorist is, when you're looking at them, they're, that they're dead, that's different. That it's already a different stage, and it's not the same as looking at them alive. Therefore, this guy could go to ask Mechila from the, this, dead, uh, this dead former friend. So great. Uh, it's such a great Chiddush that it's actually in the Ravid Azov. Ravid Azov says specifically that, and he quotes from the Zohar. It's a Beferish Zohar. It seems clear from there that it's not talking about uh, the land. That, that you, you might think so. There's a special, there's a, another prohibition of going back to the land. Here it seems to be saying about the people, Mitzrayim. And also in the, the second passage also, Vayar Yisrael, it's Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim. Not Mitzrayim, it's Mitzrayim. So in both, both times it's the same word. I thought, when I first read this story, I thought he was going to say, I'm in the Chavar Kadif show, what, uh, nobody else is around, what am I supposed to do? Uh, but yeah, it, and we, we don't have a wake, we don't, you know, the, we, don't do, we don't do such things, but it's, no, it's but not us. I, 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 I know, I'm not speaking for everybody here, but I know when the, when the Aaron is laid down into the ground, right, and Chavar Kadisha, opens the Torah, and says, Vayar Yisrael, it's Mitzrayim, 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 there's certain pieces that they put on the face, sometimes before, sometimes after. So at that point, when the body, the head is exposed, as it were, people ask for a mechila at that point. So this is not an unusual circumstance. Interesting. Never seen that. This is by the Kfur. Sorry? By the Kfur? Yes. I've been to many Kfuras. I've never seen that. Chassid Shikvar? I've been to some Chassid Shikvar. Actually, now that I think about it, each time it was raining. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so the, um, the Maharsham had an interesting question. question. Someone, his wife was pregnant, uh, I, probably they, it's been many years, they hadn't had a child. His wife's finally pregnant, so he promised if the wife um, has a boy, he'll give 36,000, I don't know, rubles, that will say dollars uh, to tzedakah. If, he has a, if she has a girl, he'll give 18,000. Not zero, not zero. That's the, way, that's the way people were. My shoe and I, we had girls first, we know... What a bracha it is to have a daughter. Absolutely. Because you're saving money to pay later for the hostage. It's not a money issue. It's a princess. <laughs> so, what happens? What happens if someone makes such a, a nether or such a shrill? What happens? He has twins. He has twins. <laughs> he had both. He had both. So the question was... So does make difference whether it came out one or not, though? One came first or not? That, that would well, well, okay. So do you pay the first one to come out? Do you pay for the last one to come out? Uh, like Yaakov and Esav. Yaakov came out second, but really it was first. Parents. What do you do? <coughs> so the Maharsham has a very interesting proof from Maseches Temura. This is why the Gedolim were not. I would never... You know, who would think to look in... in first of all, in a Mishnah. Second of all, in the middle of uh, Kachim and Taras. Okay, so the question is like this. Uh, a preg- you're, you're a, a, an animal who has a firstborn is a bachor, and you're not allowed to bring, to bring a bachor as a korban, but you're chayiv to bring a korban. So you want to figure out a way to get out of this whole bachor thing so you can bring this animal that's about to be born as the korban that you need to bring, and that way you save a little money. <coughs> so here's how you get around it. The Mishnah tells you. Kate said, ma'arimim ala bachor. How do you get around a bachor? 
So mevakeres, a pregnant animal, shahaisim uberes, pregnant, omer, right, this is going to be the firstborn, mashe b'me'eha shalzo, whatever's in this animal, im zachar, ola. If it turns out to be male, it'll, I'll bring it as a korban ola. So yol dev zachar, yikrav ola. So then you got it, it works. If the, if, the, if, she, if she gives birth to a, a zachar, a, a, a baby male, you can bring that as a korban ola. A female can't be an orla, ola, so only the, the male can be. Im nekeva, ziv shlomim. And you, you say, if it's going to be a nekeva, so then I'll bring it for as a korban shlomim. And that works also, yol dev nekeva, tikrav shlomim. That way you make it, the, sh- the neder, it's chal, while she's still pregnant before, becomes a bachor, and that way you... You, your mafkia, you remove it from the whole parsha of Bechor. Okay, so far so good. Im zachar ola im nekeva, im nekeva, im zachar ola im nekeva shlamim. Right, so you make that tnai, you make that, that neder, yolda zachar nekeva, and then the animal gives birth to both male and female. What do you do? Twins? Hazachar yikrav ola va nekeva tikrav shlamim. It's chal on both. You have to bring the male and the female as a korban. So therefore, the Marasham says you have to give fifty-four thousand dollars. You had, a, you know, you thought your maximum liability was thirty-eight thousand when you took the nether. Turns out it's, it's you got to pay one hundred and fifty percent. Good thing you didn't have triplets. Good thing you didn't have. That's right, triplets, quadruplets, uh, the, the octomom. <laughs> um, okay, we have a few more minutes. Let's do one more interesting shaila that came up. Find this. Oh. Someone came to Shlomo Avinir and asked this question. And this, this, is, this actually happened to me. I mean, nobody asked me. It was my uncle. My uncle um, married a vegetarian, and he was a vegetarian from when they got married. And then I went down to visit them in Baltimore. I spent uh, the, sh- the weekend with them, and we went out for burgers. I could say it now, 30 years later. Uh, he's already been, he passed away many years ago, but at the time, it was a, shh, don't tell anyone we're going for burgers. And we went, the two of us, we went out, and he had a burger. Probably the first burger he'd had in many, many years. <laughs> so is that mutter, or someone went to Shalom Avinir and said, I'm a vegetarian, is that a minug that I'm obligated to follow as a neder? And do I have to do hataras nadarim if I want to uh, have a little Shabbos, you know, Shabbos chicken? No mitzvah to be a vegetarian. So that's the question, is it a mitzvah or is it not? So if hey in the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch is, is talking about if you take a nether to fix some of your midos. You know, you're, you're, you're too much into the food, too much into the flesh. So you take a nether, you, you want to go the opposite direction. Take a nether, you know, I'm going to be vegetarian for a certain amount of time or forever or however you do it. You want to remove yourself from all the... Uh, uh, right, all the, all the physical pleasures and, and spend more time on the spiritual uh, task at hand. So those are nidarim that are, that are good to take, and they help you improve yourself. So it could be being a vegetarian is such a nether that uh, removes you from the meat and, uh, you know, lets you focus more on spiritual issues. So he, Rav Shlomo Aviner, is a Talmud of Rav Tzvi Yehuda Kuk. Rav Tzvi Yehuda Kuk was a Talmud of his father, the Talmud of his father, Rav Kuk. Uh, so a few times Rav Tzvi Yehuda Kuk, um, uh, Rav Tzvi Yehuda was not into eating. He apparently ate the same meal every single day. I think it was like a piece of bread and, 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 and an egg, and that was it. Something very simple like that. So his father, when they were separated for many years, his father would send him letters saying, Are you eating meat? Are you eating meat? And then he said, A time of has to know how to shecht. You know how to shecht. And they're literally letter after letter saying, Did you learn how to shecht yet? Did you learn how to shecht? Because the father believed, Rav Cook held, you should not be a vegetarian. He held, Lassi Lovos, we're all going to be vegetarians. And in Gan Eden, Adam, Adam and Chava were vegetarians, but nowadays we have bigger issues to work on, that if you focus on being kind to animals before you focus on being kind to people, it will crumb up your midos. You'll, 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 you'll have the improper focus and improper... Um, you have to improve your midos in the, in the proper step. This is... It's about, okay, so they, some people debate about what Rav Cook said, this is a tradition from his Yehuda Cook about what his father held, and Rav Cook actually wrote it. He literally wrote it. I have the book at home if anyone wants to see it. Um, so, Rav Cook actually held it's bad to be a vegetarian. So, so, so he had so he had talked about two of his Talmud. One was his son, who we just said he insisted that his son 
not be a vegetarian, refused to, to allow him to be a vegetarian. He had another Talmud called the Nazir of David Akon, uh, who had a famous son-in-law, and his son is also famous. His son-in-law was Shlomo Garin, who was the chief rabbi of, of the army, and then, and then uh, the, the Rabbanut, the Ashkenazi chief rabbi. His son, Bada Lachayim, uh, is uh, the Rav, is Rav Shar Yashuv Cohen, who's the Rav of, I think, Haifa? Um, yes, he was. Uh, so he, he's, he's still, he's, Baruch Hashem, still alive, doing well. Yeah, That's what I hear. So the Nazir lived right next door to a slaughterhouse. And he heard night, day and night these animals, poor animals, making all sorts of horrible noises, and it just touched his, pu- pulled at his soul, and he said, I can't eat meat anymore. That's understandable, and so he became a vegetarian, and his son, Rav Shah uh, has been a vegetarian his whole life. But he was the Nazir? He was a Nazir. His nazir father, Shimshon. His, his father. His father was a Nazir Shimshon. A Nazir? Yes. Um, <coughs> nowadays, you can't be an actual Nazir because we're all Tomei to Mace, but you could be a Nazir Shimshon because Shimshon was allowed to touch Mace. That's why he's called Nazir Shimshon? Right, because Shimshon was allowed to do it. But that, he was the paradigm of that Shimshon kind. Shimshon and Gibar we're talking about. Was a Nazir Shimshon. Uh, right, he, he was allowed to be Tomei Mace. Wine products and, cutting, and not cutting the hair? Correct. No wine products, no cutting the hair. And this Nazir also, he took a shvua not to leave his house unless he would go to the Koso, the Kotel. Yeah. So in those days, Jordan controlled it. So he stayed in his house for a number of years until, until the Six-Day War. His son was with the paratroopers who liberated, his son-in-law was with the paratroopers who liberated the Kotel. He blew the shofar, he said the Tvila, everybody cried. He hopped in a jeep, commandeered the jeep, you know, he's just, that was his personality. Drove straight, had the driver go straight to his father-in-law's house, picked up his father, drove him to the Kotel, and that was the first time he had been out of his house in many years. That was another. It was a special individual. So um, he was a vegetarian. So, but, uh, so it seems to be, it's not a myth to be a vegetarian. Uh, if you take a neder, so then it is a neder, the neder is chal. But if it's just a minhag, it's just a, a practice that you observe. So Shlom Avinir compares it to bringing flowers home to your wife every, every Friday. For Shabbos. It's a nice thing. It's not a neder, you know, unless you actually take it as a neder. So you don't have to do hataras in the dharm. Uh, just one interesting thing he adds that, so what about the Korban Pesach? The only time you're ever obligated to eat meat is the Korban Pesach. So let's say you're vegetarian and we reestablish the Korban Pesach. What are you going to do? So he has an interesting solution, um, which is, you're not, according to Tosvos, the Ramah disagrees. According to Tosvos, you're not obligated to bring the Korban Pesach if, you, so if you're far away, if you're Tamei, so then you have Pesach Sheni. If you don't own land in Eretz Yisrael, according to Tosfus, you're put there from the Korban Pesach, so anyone who's a vegetarian should not buy land in Eretz Yisrael, and that way they'll never be obligated in the Korban Pesach. That means if you buy a house. Does that mean if you live in, if you buy a house, though, would that be considered owning land? I, I, think, I think it would. Uh-huh. If you rent, probably that is enough to obligate you. I'm not sure I have to check it up. Um, because Chiris is, to some degree, right. uh, Kona. Right. So con- 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 conceivably, everybody then would be owning land. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. There are ways, so there are ways to get around it. There are ways to... Uh, I, don't, I don't recall if I thank the Meiri family for sponsoring tonight's uh, 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 Dinah Line. If I haven't, thank you very much for the, for the Meiris, and uh, thank you, Avshalom, for davening from the Omid. Davening from the Omid.